um, with the author Yvonne Tu. This event is co-sponsored by the Center for Comparative and Public Law at the University of Hong Kong, as well as the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Rehana Biratna. I'm the chair of this event. Uh, I'm an associate professor at CUHK Law. Uh, I'm also the executive director of the Center for Comparative uh, and Transnational Law. Uh, we've got a great program today. I'm gonna start by introducing uh, the panelists. Um, I'm then going to give a brief introduction to the book. We are then going to hear um, comments from the two discussants, followed by a response from the author, and finally a Q&A with the audience. Um, for the Q&A, I'm told that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, uh, members of the audience, please feel free uh, to send them into the Q&A. Um, at the end of uh, today's program, I will uh, go through those questions and ask some of them to the author um, as time permits. So without further ado, let me introduce everyone. Um, first, the author, Professor Yvonne Tu, is an associate professor of law at uh, the Georgetown uh, Law Center. Uh, Professor Tu writes and teaches constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and global law and religion. Um, her scholarship has been published in several leading journals. Uh, and of course, she is the author of the book we're discussing today, uh, published with Oxford University Press in 2020. Um, Professor Tu holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge, where she was a Gates Cambridge scholar. Um, I believe her first degree was also from Cambridge and she holds um, a Master of Laws LLM from Harvard Law School. Um, next, Professor Po Jen Yap, who is a professor at uh, University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. Uh, professor Yap is also the director of the Center for Comparative and Public Law, as you can see from his uh, background. Um, he is the author of several publications, including two sole authored monographs, Constitutional Dialogue in Common Law Asia, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015, and Courts and Democracies in Asia, which was published by Cambridge University Press in October 2017. Um, and last but not least, we have Professor Dian Shah from the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. Um, Professor Shah completed her LLM and SJD degrees at Duke University Law School. And prior to that, she completed an LLB from Warwick University. Um, she too is the author of many publications and in fields, including law and religion and comparative constitutional law. Most notably, she's the author of the monograph, Constitutions, Religion and Politics in Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017. So that's the panel. Let me give a quick introduction to the book um, and then we can get uh, to the comments. So this is the book. I highly recommend it to everyone um, if you haven't uh, bought it already. Um, Constitutional Statecrafts in Asian Courts. Um, this is a really careful and detailed study of constitutionalism in two Asian countries, namely Malaysia and Singapore. It combines history, theory, and practice to offer a really nuanced account of how judicial power has evolved in both countries. And it also provides a framework for how it can be developed further. That is how judicial power can be developed further. Um, the book really covers a lot of ground and I can't do it justice here. So I'll just mention a couple of things um, for now. Um, the book begins actually with a theoretical section that overviews much of the major literature in this area. Um, in that section, Yvonne is skeptical, and I think rightly so, of categorical statements about the nature of judicial power and constitutional rights. So she helpfully deconstructs and critiques several dichotomies, um, including the universal versus relativist conceptions of human rights, particularly as they manifested in the so-called Asian values debate of the 1980s and 90s, which as she points out still has resonances today. Um, the Asian values idea for those who might be unfamiliar was advanced by Lee Kuan Yew and Mahathir Mohammed, among others. And the idea is essentially that Asian cultures value community and social order, um, as opposed to sort of Western ideas of individual liberty. Um, another dichotomy she di dissects, I think, quite effectively 
is this idea of judges as either Herculean or as she calls it, Sisyphean, right? Um, so judges, as Yvonne shows, are neither all knowing kind of heroic figures who always sort of strive for justice and reach the correct result, nor are they doomed to perpetual failure. Right? And I think the main contribution of the book um, is to chart a middle path for judges right, in these two countries through a contextual analysis of judicial strategy in the service of state building. Right? Um, and these two countries are really interesting case studies. Right? They're both relatively new post-colonial states. They have relatively similar sort of post-independence political histories, both being dominated by a single party, the Barisa National Alliance in Malaysia and the People's Action Party, PAP, in Singapore. And while the PAP has never lost an election, um, Yvonne tells us in a lot of detail about how the Bar Barisa National Alliance um, actually did lose an election. Um, there was a shock loss in the 2018 election, though that government um, only lasted for a couple of years. Right? And so both of these countries have relatively fragile democracies to the extent that they have democracy at all. Um, Yvonne refers to them as dominant party democracies, which is something that Kojen um, has also written about in, in uh, great detail. Um, and in these dominant pa party democracies, there's pretty limited room for courts to maneuver, right? And so as Yvonne charts the history of judiciaries of Malaysia, of the judiciaries of Malaysia and Singapore, she shows that even though that room is limited, there is space to grow, right? And that the courts in both jurisdictions have evolved from being extremely deferential to the government on matters of constitutional law to becoming more assertive, right? And so how does this happen? Well, as Yvonne shows, it's a strategic incremental process in which courts have to navigate complex dynamics and wait for the right moment or case to arrive and seize that opportunity. And she explains how this has occurred to some extent in both countries, um, less so in Singapore, where though the judiciary is increasingly willing to review executive action, um, it hasn't quite gotten to the point of constitutional judicial review of legislation. Um, and this has happened a little more so in Malaysia, right? And she discusses at length the recent, the recent landmark cases of uh, Semini Jaya and Indira Gandhi in the Malaysian federal court, which strongly asserted the judicial power and referred to it as an unalterable right, or unamendable feature of the Malaysian constitution. So she charts the paths of these judiciaries and she also puts forth a normative argument. Right? And the normative argument as I take it um, is that the courts in Malaysia and Singapore should take on a greater role, both in protecting constitutional democracy and in constructing it further. Um, and she calls these the protective and constructive roles, right? So the protective role um, refers among other things to protecting against abusive constitutionalism, including constitutional amendments that threaten fundamental principles like separation of powers or judicial independence. Here, she defends the use of the basic structure doctrine, um, which migrated from India to Malaysia um, and has recently been adopted by the Malaysian federal court, though it should be pointed out that the Malaysian federal court has not actually struck down any constitutional amendments. Um, in Singapore, she notes that though the courts have not adopted the basic structure doctrine, there seems to be some judicial and scholarly interest in the topic. Right? And then in addition to the protective role, she talks about a constructive or transformative role that courts can play. Right? And this is developing a rights-based culture. Um, and this can be done in several ways. Um, she points out kind of two doctrinal ways this could happen. One is to give fundamental rights a broad and purposive reading. And the other is to adopt the proportionality test, um, which I think all of us have written about uh, in different guises. And it's become the kind of main test for kind of adjudicating fundamental rights around the world. And Yvonne makes a powerful case that they should be adopted in these contexts as well. So I'll stop there. Um, it's a terrific book. I enjoyed reading it, um, and I look forward to the discussion. Let me hand over to uh, Po Jin Yap. Thank you so much. So again, it's a huge privilege to be collaborating for the first time with Rehan Center at CUHK. And it's also a privilege to be honoring Professor Tu's book, again, because I've been on several tours with her on Zoom, discussing this formidable and magnificent achievement of a book. And so my arguments, in a way, um, some are rehearsed before her, so she would have a response, but we enjoy talking about arguments because most of the time we have 
a slight disagreement on how we read and interpret the cases. But as I've mentioned before, that our disagreement is a debate between friends. And I've used this analogy where it's the difference between President Biden and Senator Warren, and she is Senator Warren, who is more progressive in her reading of the Constitution than I am. So I have much to learn, and she's still prompting me to develop a more progressive agenda, and I'm, I'm indebted to her on that account. Uh, Rihan has summed up the book very well, so I will not rehash it. I'll just go straight into the three main arguments she laid out. So the, her three main arguments is this, right? Courts especially in dominant party democracies, have to engage in some kind of statecraft. And she proposes three main tools of statecraft. The first is judges must defend the constitutional order, the democratic order, by recognizing some kind of basic structure doctrine. Right? Number two, she argues that courts must give a purposive interpretation to the constitution. Number three, Right? She believes in the proportionality review of legislation. I think we in Hong Kong are well familiar with this doctrine, but this is less developed in other democracies. Right? Uh, I'll just start the second argument first, which is the purposive interpretation. As Yvonne knows, I'm very skeptical of this argument because I'm too much of a crit and legal realist. Right? So I, I don't believe there's this objective search for the purpose of the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> and to use one of her, uh, her example, right, was the controversial decision of whether, and the constitutional issue was, right, whether a Muslim has a constitutional right to renounce her faith without the permission of the Sharia courts, right? That was the constitutional question. And she seeks to find the answer in the purpose of the constitution. But if we look at the text, the text on one hand says, that Islam is the uh, official religion of the country. On the other hand, it says that other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony. So I would say that a general, general phrased term like that will not be able, no one can really discern from all these vague texts exactly what the answer is to that question that the court had to face. At the end, it will be policy choices and not an objective search for a purpose. I don't believe that a history or the text of the constitution would answer this point. At the end, I think Yvonne and I are in agreement on the policy outcome we both want, but I would be more candid and say that's because of our politics than the purpose of the constitution, right? So that would be my first point. The second goes to basic structure. And so she argues, and I think most of us will agree with her, that in the, the court's role is to impose certain limits on constitutional change, such that you know, the parliament may not, in the name of amending the constitution, abolish it. And she discussed with great clarity and with great insight the case in Malaysia, right, uh, where the federal court for the very first time struck down a constitutional amendment that was passed in the 80s to remove the term judicial power expressly from what the court uh, possessed. And she, uh, let me go to her piece. Uh, and she uh, very kindly cited my prior work and marked some disagreement, disagreement with it. So she says that this case is an example of how courts assert judicial power and it's not dialogic. This is not about, it's not concern about contributing to a continuum constitutional colloquial with the political institution, but it's about asserting and enhancing judicial power, not restraining it. I think Professor Tew is completely correct that the court here was enhancing judicial power. But in my opinion, it was also dialogic at the same time. Because number one, as Professor Tew notes, the court actually never say that the amendment was unconstitutional, it was the effect. Number two, the court actually said that the decision would only apply prospectively. Therefore, all decisions made prior to the court's decision were unaffected, thereby providing stability to all the prior decisions made and not overturning past decisions made by the government. So, and third, the law that was struck now was in a way very insignificant. It was about, you know, 
land consent, uh, uh, compensation and whether lay persons could overturn judicial findings. Right? So in a way, it was not one of those high stakes decisions where are removing prime ministers or striking down some significant uh, you know, federal criminal law like the national security law. Right? So in that sense, I'll say that you know, while Professor Tew is correct that the decision was an enhancement of judicial power, but the two, and it, but it's equally dialogic and it was in a way uh, accommodating to governmental concerns. Uh, finally, I will end by talking about proportionality. And in this sense, I think uh, Professor Tew and I, are, we are in complete agreement that you know, we believe that when courts judge the constitutionality of rights, they should always subject the legislation to a structured proportionality analysis. And I think Rehan has actually discussed a lot on this in his book chapter, right? And uh, uh, Yvonne has discussed the first case where the courts, the federal court use proportionality to strike down legislation in Malaysia. And this is a huge thing. But prior to the collapse of the UMNO government, courts flirted with the doctrine, but they have never used it to strike down legislation. And they did so after a, a turnover. But unfortunately, because the government or the, 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 the then government collapsed so quickly, it would appear in recent years, or in recent months anyway, that the courts have reverted to its traditional orthodoxy, right? So notably in the recent decision when the court had to decide the mandatory, whether the mandatory death sentence for drug trafficking was constitutional, they upheld it and they didn't even cite the proportionality test, right? And instead, all they say is that this is a matter which is for the legislative policy to be decided by parliament and it's not for the courts to review its wisdom, right? No proportionality here. But we see some positive developments in Singapore, right? Because Singapore, when Rihan and I were working on proportionality in Asia, Singapore was still one of the firm outliers rejecting the proportionality review of rights in any form, or at least in but since then, Singapore, even Singapore too, is joining this global chorus of proportional, proportionality advocates. In the first decision, the Chief Justice in a three-member panel wrote that you know, in deciding whether an uncodified policy can be used to override a man, a, a man in a same-sex relationship, same-sex relationships, right to biologically, uh, sorry, to adopt his biological son, right? The courts says that this must be, this, uh, the, the court will have to engage in a balancing test and everything must have a sense of proportion. And the, var the factors and variables that he looked at resemble proportionality. But that was a step one. Um, in, in, and secondly, that was only, and that only concerned whether a right can be vindicated over an uncodified legislative purpose, right? And the court said no. But in a more recent case, right, uh, on the constitutionality of the Public Order Act, the court actually said that in deciding whether legislation is constitutional or not, they will apply a three-stage test, right? They didn't use the proportionality at all, right? The word proportionality was not used. But let me read out the, the test, right? Number one, the legislation must be for enumerated purpose. Number two, there must be a nexus between the purpose and the legislation. And number three, there must be a balance between competing stakes. Not a single word, I mean, there was no use of the word proportionality, but we all know this is proportionality in all but name, right? So in a way, regardless, even though the courts have not actually said so, I think Singapore courts have now joined the chorus. And I think Professor Tiu in a way is prophetic in, in so far as she urged the courts even before they have done so to move towards this. And I think the courts here have responded. I think it's a great thing. Interestingly, I will also just add that Chief Justice Menon in an extrajudicial address in defending his uh, gay rights decision that was uh, progressive, cited constitutional dialogue and common law Asia and said that the reason the courts did so was because the courts 
have a role in engaging in constitutional dialogue and to ensure that each branch of government can fulfill their own assigned constitutional functions. So on that note, I think I would just like to end my commentary and to congratulate Professor T once again for writing a book that's going to reshape our thinking of courts in the region. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Po Chen. Uh, let's now turn to uh, Professor Dian Xia. Can you hear me? Yep, good. Uh, thank you, CUHK and HKU, uh, especially Rehan and Pojan, for uh, the opportunity to participate in, in this book panel. Um, and I would just like to echo uh, Pojan in, in thanking Yvonne too for this contribution to the growing scholarship on constitutional law uh, in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, this is a book that I find to be readable, uh, accessible, and uh, it is a great resource for those seeking to understand uh, the ebb and flow of constitutional adjudication and litigation, particularly in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, I'm glad that Pojan has started us off with the three main arguments of, of um, Yvonne's book, going into the very details about uh, methods or tools of interpretation, because my comments today would focus more on kind of the broader um, themes um, of the book. And here I'd like to focus on the two uh, core themes uh, in, in this book. There are of course several, but for me, uh, particularly thinking about this uh, comparatively, the two themes that stood out are constitutional politics uh, and also constitutional culture and judicial strategies in light of constitutional politics and the broader social and political contexts that uh, courts find themselves in. Uh, so these two, two points, or, or three rather, are, are fundamentally tied to each other. Uh, so by now we know that the core premise, at least as I understand it, of uh, Yvonne's book is that in the face of uh, changing political imperatives or what she calls changing political narratives. Uh, it is more important to focus on strengthening constitutional institutions uh, in building constitutional democracies. Now in her book, uh, Yvonne focuses on courts and their role in the process of democratization and building or uh, consolidating constitutional democracy in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, I'll start by emphasizing uh, constitutional politics in both Malaysia and uh, Singapore. Uh, and, and just to say that, uh, you know, constitutional politics in these two countries are multi-dimensional. Uh, they are characterized and shaped by a variety of factors, some of which are more pronounced in one country uh, uh, than others. Um, you know, I often engage with a bit of banter with my colleagues here in, in Singapore because Singapore constitutional law and development uh, for me, at least, does strike as a little boring and, and, and predictable <laughs> compared to the kinds of constitutional contestations and constitutional politics that we see uh, in, in Malaysia or even in countries like India, Sri Lanka or Indonesia. Um, in any case, this consideration or observe, uh, observation about the multidimensional nature of constitutional politics, in my opinion, uh, can certainly be extrapolated to Asia more generally. Uh, in short, my point is that I, I don't consider Malaysia and, uh, and, and the Singapore experience to be constitutive or characteristic of Asia as a whole, uh, but I do find that there are patterns uh, of similarities and differences across jurisdictions. And I think this uh, has been highlighted in uh, uh, Yvonne's book uh, as well. Now, uh, one feature that informs and defines the dynamics of constitutional politics in Malaysia and Singapore, as Yvonne uh, correctly highlighted in her book, is the dominant party regime. And I have a few points uh, in this respect. Um, first is that I agree that this has informed judicial deference and, and even judicial strategies in key cases implicating uh, constitutional rights. Um, I must say, however, that this uh, pattern of deference, um, and I think Yvonne highlighted this in the book as well, is, is more uneven or inconsistent in Malaysia than in, in Singapore. Uh, in other words, there have been times uh, during the Barisan National 60 plus year rule uh, that the courts have even been willing to push boundaries, right, even if they had not explicitly struck down a law. Uh, and in Singapore, where deference, in, in my opinion, is 
more pronounced than it is in, in Malaysia, there are different levels of deference and shifts uh, in such levels, depending on the case that's at stake and perhaps even the personnel or the leadership uh, of the court. Uh, Jacqueline Neal, my colleague here at NUS, for instance, argues that uh, there has been a, a shift from strong deference in earlier cases in the Singapore jurisprudence to more milder or, or more modest uh, deference in recent cases. Now, uh, on the flip side, in Indonesia, in the post Soharto period, where there has been a greater degree of political pluralism and competition, uh, they have util the, the Indonesian Constitutional Court has utilized what Simon Butt calls uh, tempering techniques, uh, which in some cases amounted to legislative deference, but in the broader scheme of things, demonstrates the court's more pragmatic uh, considerations with respect to the power that they have or hope to exercise uh, in the future. Uh, now, this brings me to my uh, second point, which is that th there is another dimension to co constitutional politics in certain, but certainly not all jurisdictions in Asia, which is the salience of ethnicity and religion in the social and political spheres. Uh, this, for me, is certainly more noticeable in countries like Malaysia and to some extent, Indonesia, uh, India and Sri Lanka as well. Uh, in Malaysia, for instance, the fidelity to text and constitutional history has at one point become the basis for ascribing a limited role for Islam in the constitutional order, as Yvonne highlighted in her book. And this was the case of Che Omar in 1988, where the Supreme Court had to determine the implications of Article 3, which constitutionalizes Islam as the religion of the Federation. Uh, yet, in another case, which we uh, uh, see just 12 years later, uh, in a case about the wearing of a religious headgear in, in public schools, the High Court there took the position that Islam is a complete way of life, uh, and thus any regulations that are contrary to Islam can be invalidated. And on top of that, uh, this judge asserted that uh, by relying on constitutional history, he asserted that the Malay rulers demanded uh, the establishment uh, of Islam as the state religion so as to recognize the supremacy of Islam. Now, we know from, from the various writings that have been written on Article 3 and also from Yvonne's book that this is simply just uh, uh, not true. So my point here is that interpretive approaches and dominant party regimes aside, uh, decisions like this uh, have to be understood within the context of the political salience of religion and ethnicity in the constitutional order. Uh, one can say the same about the Indonesian Constitutional Court's decision to uphold the blasphemy law in 2010, uh, as well as the trial and decision of the Jakarta District Court uh, and the Supreme Court in the blasphemy case involving the former Jakarta governor in 2017 and 2018. And in a similar but not completely identical vein uh, in Thailand, you know, the role of courts, uh, constitutional adjudication and constitutional politics, they are all set against this background of the notion of Thainess, which uh, um, my colleagues in Thailand, Rawin Lila Patana and Suprawi Asanasak, they argue that this is inextricably linked to the concept of the righteous Buddhist uh, monarchy. So all these considerations in my view are, are, are crucial in understanding and interrogating the role of courts uh, in the process of democratization and in building or in consolidating constitutional democracy in Asia. Um, I guess here, I, I'd love to hear more from, from Yvonne later on on how these considerations, you know, the inconsistencies, the ebb and flow of judicial deference or decision-making, the multidimensional nature of constitutional politics, how all this figure into your assessment of the significance of courts in constitutional statecraft. Uh, and this now brings me to my second and final issue, which concerns constitutional culture and, and judicial strategies. Uh, Yvonne's book 
highlight the uh, assertion of what she calls the power to review amendments that undermine the basic uh, structure of the constitution. Uh, uh, she she, she um, uses the terms strategic uh, assertions of power in order to safeguard what she calls the core structures of, of democracy. Now, uh, this is a very interesting um, argument. Uh, in relation to this, Yvonne also correctly notes that Evolving, uh, evolving democracies in Asia, they have yet to develop robust uh, constitutional cultures. Uh, while this certainly does not mean uh, that courts should completely avoid judicial review, um, I also think that for courts to play an important role in building constitutional democracies, uh, there must be a constitutional consciousness and mobilization to bring contestation and cases to court, to appeal and to petition the court to resolve crucial constitutional questions and by extension then shape the constitutional identity of the state. Now, on this point, and to get us thinking about this uh, even further, I want to highlight Ben Chantal's work on Buddhist interest uh, litigation in Sri Lanka where he illustrates how the Buddhism chapter in the Sri Lankan constitution, which provides that the state has a duty to protect and foster the Buddha Sasana, uh, has actually provided opportunities and incentives for Buddhist nationalists to elevate their concerns and make particular claims about the status of Buddhism in the constitutional order. Uh, so here, the courts, as Chantal persuasively argues, they don't just wait around to resolve existing religious grievances. They then instead become a forum to generate, publicize, and even legitimize particular constitutional claims and those religious grievances that uh, uh, the society has. Uh, and in some cases, the outcomes have proven to be counterproductive co to constitutional uh, democracy. So thinking about this in terms uh, of constitutional interpretation and judicial strategies, um, following a formalist approach may not always, at least in my opinion, reflect judicial deference, and it may not necessarily be part of a conscious judicial strategy to preserve or build its, its authority in the long run. Likewise, deference could manifest itself through the use of various different interpretive doctrines and methods, including purposive interpretation. Now, there is some evidence of this in Singapore and in countries like Indonesia as well. With regard to Indonesia, as I mentioned earlier, strategic deference as opposed to strategic assertiveness, for instance, uh, by using uh, tools such as conditional constitutionality, this has over time evolved and allowed courts to actually increase uh, its powers. Um, of course, there is a lot more to this story than, and, and this is where constitutional, again, sorry, constitutional culture again comes in, right? Constitutional literacy and consciousness uh, have actually increased in Indonesia since the fall of Suharto. And to add to that, while some politicians and government officials have criticized even publicly decisions of the Indonesian Constitutional Court, they do at least recognize that the decisions are binding and they try to follow them even if slowly and reluctantly. And there is also the fact that the Indonesian Constitutional Court has garnered significant public support since its inception. So perhaps these uh, judicial strategies ought to be analyzed and thought about uh, in, in a more comprehensive manner, not just vis-a-vis -vis other political branches that the courts respond to, but also in terms of the wider political dynamics in the society and popular or public support. So, so I wonder, Yvonne, if you also have further thoughts uh, about this. Uh, and in relation to that, it would be also interesting to hear if you have any thoughts about the recent cases in Malaysia, as uh, Pojan highlighted, where the basic structure doctrine has essentially been uh, you know, unraveled. If in Semenya Jaya and Indira Gandhi, the court exercised uh, what you call strategic assertions of power to lay the foundation for safeguarding judicial power and separation of powers, how do these latest decisions then alter that and where do they figure into uh, your ideas on constitutional uh, statecraft? Um, to conclude, uh, 
I'd say that I would also love to hear more from you, Yvonne, on the significance of the political change in 2018 and the subsequent change of government into 2020 uh, and, and, and the significance of these events on the courts and on constitutional statecraft uh, in Malaysia. I think this is very important because it might help us think about political change or more subtle forms of regime change elsewhere in the region, such as in Indonesia and in Malaysia. So I'll stop there. Congratulations again, Yvonne, uh, on, on the book. And I look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts. Okay, thank you very much, Diat. And actually, thank you both for those comments. I think they were really substantive. Um, let me hand over to uh, Professor Yvonne Q. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much, Rian. Uh, Projet and Diane for this and let, first let me just say how delighted and honored I am at this opportunity to have this wonderful discussion with all of you today and my thanks to HKU and CUHK as well. My only regret is that I am not there and that we're not able to be there in person um, but many many thanks to Rehan and Pojan for their generosity in organizing this um, this all-star panel, um, Rehan, Dian, and Pojan are, I think, like a dream panel on comparative constitutionalism in Asia. All these panelists are scholars I have long, uh, long engaged with and whose work has both challenged and inspired my own. So it's a distinct pleasure to be able to speak to all of you. Um, Rehan, I've had the pleasure of engaging with for many years, uh, and I've, I've followed your work on South Asia and towering judges most recently with, with great interest. Uh, and Pojan and I did our PhD together at Cambridge, where we both had the same PhD supervisor, which was the start of many debates and conversations even then about the role of courts in Malaysia and Singapore. So I greatly, I greatly enjoyed the regular back and forth we have had over all those years, even or especially when we disagree, um, as well as about topics that inspire an equal amount of passion, such as the best places to eat in every city we visit. Um, and Dian, you know, a fellow Malaysianist, you know, and and I have learned so much from Dian's work on religion and constitution making in in divided societies in Asia, including, of course, Malaysia, and her work on constitutional adjudication and the broader political and social context that informs all of this, uh, and. Of course, I, uh, and I'm delighted to have the NUS representation here because um, the work of you and your colleagues have so informed so much of my own. So thank you so much for this really rich and, and discussion. Um, I suppose the one silver lining of having a virtual panel in the midst of a pandemic is the remarkably international range of this panel as evidenced by all the people who are participating across the world in at least three different time zones from DC to Singapore to Hong Kong and all of you participating at, you know, probably 10 p.m. ish now in Asia. I'm deeply indebted to all of you for staying up this late to discuss the book, which I think is a testament to the extraordinary engagement, support, and generosity that all of you, the panelists, and even those on the list of the, the attendees have shown and continue to show to others in the field. So we're very grateful and humbled by your efforts. Okay, so in terms of responses, so there was a lot there. It was really rich. I, I look forward to thinking and developing my thoughts on all of these issues in greater, in greater um, detail, but I mean, I might mention a few points specific to some of to what Pojin and Diane have brought up, and then I'll, uh, and I'll tie that then to some, some broader uh, comments I have on the book as a whole that, that engages with these points. Um, so I'll take the, I'll, so let me start with, with, um, with speaking to so my first point, I think I'll start with like bringing up the, the, the main, I think, the main, the, the main points that Pojan has brought up on dialogic judicial review, which of course, you know, um, Professor Yap is the noted expert on. So on the note on like on whether this is dialogic review or whether this is a different form of judicial statecraft or more, or a, 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 a more assertive, aggressive form of judicial review. But to be clear, I, I want to just be clear that I am not against the courts using dialogic or constitutional tools that Pojan describes um, he, he characterized us as being as being essentially 
um, the Joe Biden versus Elizabeth Warren situation. I might prefer Nancy Pelosi in this situation, but uh, insofar as I don't think that I am, uh, what I'm doing here is possibly not as as far left as Poetian characterizes in that. I do think that insofar as courts are able to develop greater constitutional engagement between the institutional branches using dialogic tools as, as uh, Pojan describes in his, his book, they should do so. My argument, though, is, is that in certain situations, there is value in the judiciary asserting its authority to protect core structural um, principles or rights guarantees. And here, and at this point, I'll, I'll bring up like, the cases that we've talked about, and the tools or strategies I described, I do see them as more than simply dialogic. So we agree, I think, on some of the features of some of the cases that we've been talking about. Pojan described um, the case, for example, of Semenya Jaya in 2017 as about enhancing judicial power and dialogic at the same time for features like uh, does not say the amendment is unconstitutional, uh, the decision will apply prospectively, the law struck down was insignificant, it was about land compensation, it's just this prosaic, pragmatic matter. I, I entirely agree that those are the features of that case. I see those though as not as the court not necessary as, as the court using strategy in using those types of features to enhance judicial power, not necessarily because it wants to have a dialogue with the government in the sense of, I take dialogue, according to Pojan's account, to be about wanting to collaborate with the, with the um, political branches of government. I see the court more as building up its own cachet of judicial power in order to be able to assert power against the political branches, should it need to do so in the future. The tool that it's using in Semeni Ajay that it's building up is essentially laying the seeds for a tool to review unconstitutional Constitutional, constitutional amendments. That is an immensely powerful tool and one that is clearly, I think, like against a, a that would clearly like invalidate a legislative action. I see that as I see that as a often often viewed in a lot of contexts as the ultimate counter majoritarian tools. So in that sense, I see um, the cases like Samanji Jaya, and then you know, more interestingly, even like a year after that, building on that case in Indira Gandhi as primarily directed at strengthening um, the judicial power vis-a-vis -vis the political branches, again, in a context where the judiciary has traditionally had not a lot of power, right? has been fairly, like, has been fa has been fairly deferential and passive vis-a-vis -vis the political branches. So my sense in, 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 in those situations, at least in the Malaysian context, is that there is quite a, deal, a degree of um, judicial strategy going on there that is directed towards um, enhancing power, not towards the aim of, of being dialogic with the government, although there may be some cases where they are, but in, 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 but in order to build up the judiciary's own power. I do think that in the Singapore context, as, as Pojan brings up, it may well be that the courts are more interested in a dialogic type of a dialogic type of um, conversation with the government and therefore have been much more incremental, as both panelists have pointed out, the Singapore courts have been much more deferential and much more incremental building up the, that sort of um, cachet in a much more incremental way. But in the Malaysian context, as Dian points out, the courts have actually been far more, the ebb and flow has been like about judicial, trying to gain back that sort of constitutional redemption of judicial assertion of power, I think, rather than necessarily seeing the judiciary in this cooperative partnership with the government, more than seeing itself as having to be sometimes a necessary check and balance in that in the in in, in in a regime like this so I think that's one thing I will say on um, on the dialogic response although again like in terms of the other doctrines like proportionality uh, and purpose of interpretation uh, as Pojan has brought up like I think like these are also tools that courts can use in a more dialogic way so I feel like those tools like proportionality and even purposism despite Pojan's um, skepticism, I think, like, are essentially constitutional adjudication or constitutional interpretation tools, right? And I think I will say on that note on whether or not, you know, purposive interpretation is is um, objective or not. I mean, to some extent, I don't know that any of these tools are, are purely objective if we're looking at them from a, I mean, I don't think one can look at constitutional adjudication as, the, as a completely neutral objective idea of like, what constitutionalism is, right? They're all essentially about constitutional argument and constitutional narrative. And so to the extent that courts are gonna use these tools, I think like an idea of what the general framework or purpose of the constitution was, uh, framework was, was, was meant to accomplish is an important backdrop to have in the in the realm of constitutional adjudication, and for uh, and in my account, like how what court should and how court should use these 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 contextual back this contextual framework in order to 
uh, found their constitutional arguments. So that's on. Uh, so that's my first point on like the on the um, on the dialogic point and the judicial tools. And then second, um, to to go to Dien's broad point on constitutional politics. Um, so there's a lot here. So a number of points. Just as a starting remark, I think the dominant party political system, and uh, which Rian also brought up in his remarks. I think I would I would characterize. What I'm doing here like, actually has two different exemplars. So it's Singapore, I think, is like the par excellence example for a dominant party system. Malaysia maybe was in that category, but I see it now as much more a fragile democracy. Post like the 2018 and then post the 2020 collapse of the government, I think it's much more in a sort of a, 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 a situation that's much more fragile and transitional than a situation where the dominant party has never lost power in its history that's clearly no longer the case in Malaysia even though that was I mean even though that's been uh, that that itself has gone through iterations I still think like it shows a difference from the Singapore model so I think like this is this is interesting because it gives us sort of two two regime types come in that have gone in somewhat different directions and so that's one thing I'll start off with and then on the contemporary so on the political landscape in Malaysia, which I think we could all spend like a lot of time talking about um, tonight, I think, uh, so I'll say this on the contemporary political landscape there, I think like the political context undoubtedly matters, right? That's always mattered. The 2018 democratic regime was certainly an important, seen as an important shift at that point, which gave the courts more space to maneuver and renegotiate the institutional position. And then with the 2020 collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government, I mean, some have wondered, as Diana has pointed out, as Pojan alluded to, whether that tale of uh, democratic triumph uh, is fatal now for uh, the idea of courts and constitutionalism and the construction of constitutionalism and the account that I that I give in the book. So I think it, is, it certainly might be a setback, but it's certainly not fatal, right? I think it, 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 at least in my uh, at least how I perceive this, and here's why. I mean, I want, the one is that Malaysia in 2020 is not Malaysia in 1988. It's not even Malaysia in 2017. And it is, as we just alluded to, no longer controlled solely by a dominant political party. The, even the current governing coalition is far more fragile than the Barisan National Coalition, which had controlled politics for 60 years. The prime minister is current, that's currently in power, uh, Muhyiddin, is in power, but is holding on by barely a thread, one might say, has, has, uh, is, not, is studiously avoiding calling parliament in order uh, to avoid, sort of, it, well, widely seen as one of the moves to avoid, like having a vote of confidence call in parliament, right? So they support even their, the, the fact that we're in emergency, that Malaysia is an emergency at this point. All of this points to, I think, the fact that Malaysia is, as I've said, no longer a dominant party state, but rather a fragile democracy. And in a fragile democracy, I think the role of courts in protecting is not just about protecting the constitutional order, they also have the potential to play a greater role in constructing constitutionalism. Um, and I think we saw, even like post the collapse in 2020, in terms of the court and the role of judicial constitutionalism in Malaysia, a a, a sign that you know at least in some cases like that that was a degree of a sh a, a, a move towards greater judicial assertiveness even after the 20 um, 20 collapse right I will so not only after 2020 collapse but I also point out that Sumanija and Indira Gandhi were both before the 2018 electoral upset so I think that shows um, some judicial willingness to already sort of expand the institution and to that had emerged even before the dominant regime at that time had gone out of power. That was Sumanian Indira Gandhi. Um, but as the end has pointed out, there have been traces of this even in the past from Siva Rasa in 2010 um, and also in like various various cases that you've seen the court assert power and then retreat and then like, assert power again. Uh, nevertheless, like that whole line of constitutional adjudication sowed the seeds that the court was later able to rely on in cases like the 2017 and 2018 landmark decisions. Um, and then after the collapse of the government in 2020, it might be, I mean, I might point out that in July 2020, in the case involving the 1MDB financial scandal, the KL, the Kuala Lumpur High Court convicted um, the ex former Prime Minister Najib Raza of all seven accounts of abuse of power, breach of trust, and money laundering the first time I think a former prime minister in the Malaysian context has ever been convicted of corruption related charges which I think it was a, it was a, a striking show of in this case I had the Malaysian High Court uh, showing some will asserting willingness to assert judicial authority and independence even in the face of the ruling the, a, a new ruling regime that had come into power at that point 
So the recent cases also, and so now let me move to some of the recent cases we've seen in 2021 that show, that appear to show a retreat from the basic structure doctrine, right? These will be some of the cases like um, Maria Chin in January, uh, the, and the recent case in February, the habeas corpus cases, where it's that where uh, the majority of the court, both of those cases, seem to have walked back some of the for some of the um, the proclamations about the basic structure doctrine that we talked about in the Samini Jaya and Indira Gandhi cases, um, and, for, and and some people and some have, have said that this shows sort of the death of the of the basic structure doctrine uh, or its development in the Malaysian context, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so my response would basically be one to, to of I think the same way that I think in, even in the past I would have been cautious of saying that the basic structure doctrine is completely and entirely entrenched in the Malaysian context. I'm also cautious now to sort of say that's completely and entirely dismantled, you know, given like these cases. I think the first point would be the story of the Malaysian court's journey has always been uneven throughout its history. It's, it's always been a one step forward, one step back, sometimes even if it has to be two steps back. It's never been a linear line, it's zigs and zags, right? And so we see this sort of like move forward and backwards in a lot of in a lot of these contexts. Uh, you know, from Siva Rasa articulating the basic structure doctrine to a pullback after the 2010, and then Samani Jaya and Indira Gandhi, and then now apparently a pullback in Maria Chin and some of Ed Roti and some of these other cases. So I think it would be a mistake to think that the cases fell as an irreversible or fatal turn. The uh, I will also note, secondly, that uh, in a lot of these cases, it was a majority-minority decision. It was like a divided decision, and the chief justice, strikingly, has been did, has, been, has issued strong dissents in these cases, which sort of suggests that the chief justice is very much invested in upholding the precedent of Samani and Indira. It might be a case of marshalling like judges on the court towards a side, but it, it shows it doesn't show sort of a unanimous opinion going one way. And then finally, like the political climate remains very unstable. So well, anything might happen after, especially after COVID. It subscribes, uh, uh, subsides, and so you know we we again in a fragile sort of context that we may see future changes in the government, and and I think it for, it will be up to a future court to either confine some of these cases to their facts or confine them to their to to their particular types of ruling. Most of these cases have basically distinguished themselves from Samini and Indira Gandhi, saying that the facts here are not exactly the same. So I think a similar thing if need it could be done in future in a future trajectory. And so finally, my third and final point here would be to kind of also uh, is, is, is this, that my account is ultimately a normative one, right? And so, yes, like some part of this has been about, you know, describing or analyzing some of the, the trajectory of the judiciary in these types of contexts, but ultimately, um, my account is, is not just about what judges are doing, but what judges should do. Um, at, to that and to that extent, I think like you know the account here and the tools that I lay out show both that they have that they uh, show how they have been that have been there's movement towards them being developed, but it's also an account to argue that normatively like these are the the, the tools of statecraft that can be used and fit within the political to use like the ends with sort of like the, the the political and broader social and political context of these of these constitutional cultures and the constitutional cultures should evolve or should or should um, should develop along this direction would be the argument that I that I would make um, in these contexts they're not necessarily these tools are ultimately like helpful tools that may that are tools or strategies they don't on their own do magic work but they can be helpful and effective strategies for judges especially I argue in fragile democracies or dominant party democracies and in an emerging democracy where the legislature and executive have historically enjoyed such consolidated political power, I think it is a good thing for judges to develop the kinds of tools that help them to rebalance power in the constitutional order, that help the courts to become more effective institutions, to wield some form of constitutional constraint on political power, and also, in, if, if the opportunity arises, also to help construct constitutionalism in these, in these contexts. So, if I was to like, sum up sort of my, my, my ultimate position at this point, um, I think it is probably one of cautious optimism that you know we hope that, that I hope the, uh, the to, to see sort of this as part of a, an ongoing to coin a phrase project dialogue with scholars in the region and uh, with the and with courts in the region to continue this uh, to 
this this colicky towards building constitutionalism and in that endeavor i do think that not just i mean that not just the courts but i think the courts are part of it should be like one of the constitutional institutions that um that that are very much part of this endeavor towards both protecting and constructing constitutionalism so thank you and thank you again to all of you for those really great comments great thank you so much yvonne um we're going to move to q a in a second so if folks in the audience have questions um, please write them in in the q and I think some people already have already. Um, I'm going to start with a quick comment and then a question. Comment is mostly a joke, though not exactly, um, which is when I was first doing the Towering Judges project, I wanted someone to write a profile of Gopal Sriram as a towering judge in his own head, but not in reality. And I mentioned this to Poja and he said, well, he's now been proven right in some ways, right? Kind of borrowing all this Indian jurisprudence and basic structure, things that he would have liked. So I'm glad that that didn't materialize. But on a more serious note, I just wanted to follow up on this basic structure point. Um, you mentioned that there seems to be some kind of pulling back um, with the recent cases. And I wonder if one way to make sense of it is just about the subject matter of the cases. And you hinted this a little bit in the book, and I think Dion mentioned this as well, which is there does seem to be a kind of regional trend that basic structure at least in Asia, maybe everywhere, is really now just about judicial power. And it's a kind of turf protecting mechanism that courts are going to use. And if it's another kind of basic structure principle, habeas corpus, you know, other kinds of separation of powers concerns, elections, judges are not going to kind of stick their necks out for those. We see this in India, we see this in Bangladesh. Um, so I'm wondering if you think that is perhaps a good way to understand it or if that's overly simplistic. I think that's, I mean, I, I, I think that's exactly it. Like, I think like the, I think of the three tools that I outlined, the basic structure is much more the protective mechanism and the other two are much more the constructive ones. And when we see that the courts using basic structure, and of course your work here is hugely um, informative on this too, it's really a, a judges tend to be, to tend to be most inclined to assert this when it's sort of a Hail Mary kind of situation, right? Where, where there's a, there's a turf in, where there's a turf incursion, like when there's a definite incursion on judicial power, Power, the judges are like, well, yeah, now is the time, if ever, to use this pretty aggressive tool. And so, like, I think, like, when it, then, when judges have done it, that tends to be. We see this in India. We see this in Pakistan. We see this um, even in the the in the in the Malaysian context. And you know, I and I think like one of the things that struck me about the recent cases, and I and um, then I like you know briefly looked through with uh, some of the, the ones that happened this year in twenty twenty one, is that these cases have been. Let, one could characterize them a little bit as less, and, and many of the, the judges, even the majority judgments in the cases themselves, characterize them as not about taking away judicial power from the judiciary. So in other words, they're saying like, you know, this is not a, you know, case of Maria Chin with the immigration director, or case, or even the case of like the uh, habeas corpus case. The 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 judges are essentially saying like, you know, that these are, uh, this, this these these types of contexts are not about are not about removal of judicial power or conferral of judicial power to a non-judicial branch in the way that Samanya Jaya was. Uh, at least like, that's how the majority characterizes this, right? And so by saying that, they're sort of saying that, you know, that, that they're like, well, con these cases are a different sort of uh, contextual factual situation and therefore doesn't, um, and, and therefore, you know, we don't see the need to extend basic structure in these types of cases. Now, I mean, like, people could defer on whether that's too cautious of the judges or, or whether, you know, one could use these cases as a, as a way to further develop these structured doctrine. But there's one way to see them, which is that if they're not sort of this dream where a judge has to, like, stick, as you've put it, you know, stick their neck out, um, courts tend to, and I, maybe in some cases should be, sort of careful also about the the about about the extent to which it is very powerful to being able to review constitutional amendments should be to should be pushed right and so I think like one way to see that is that these these cases could be is is certainly not the most you know, not robust but at the same time I think like if, if they are also not it's a fatal walking back of the basic structure doctrine in my reading. Can I just interject here to supplement whatever Yvonne just said, which I agree completely? Is that based on my research, I find that judges have been most successful in transitional democracies when they use the basic structure doctrine to protect judicial independence. And when they use the basic structure doctrine to actually 
you know, encroach on so-called legislative power, then that's where they might end up being, you know, cut down by the political bunches. While, while they're just merely fencing off their turf, like striking down, say, ouster clauses, or you know, protecting judicial power, they are most likely to succeed with that, such expression. And even in Singapore, while the courts have actually not openly recognized basic structure, they have also not closed the door. And the, the reason why is that they, they, they hinted that it's possible that as far as ouster clauses and if the judiciary is affected, then possibly one could say that, you know, that there will be certain limits on what parliament can do when they amend the constitution. So I think that for transitional democracies, the protection of judicial independence and protection of judicial power might probably be the safest line of defense. Great. I'm going to now turn to the Q&A. So we have a couple of comments from my PhD student, uh, Samit Sankar. Um, the first two, I think, are combined. Uh, and they're essentially expressing support for Yvonne's use of or advocacy for purpose of interpretation. So thanks for that, Samit. And then he has a question, which is, how have courts enforced and implemented international human rights law, if at all, in Singapore and Malaysia? And whether, I guess, maybe if that's part of this sort of statecraft that you talk about. Um, that's a great question, and I will certainly defer to Diane on some of this, because uh, uh, on some of these points um, on international human rights law. But my sense is that uh, you sort of see an ebb, again, to use Diane's phrase, an ebb and flow in, in a lot of ways in the judicial, in the constitutional adjudication. And one of the ebb and flows, which I talk about in the book, is like the ebb and flow of the so-called four walls doctrine in the Malaysian and Singapore context and the four walls the four walls idea being well we only look at our domestic four walls of the domestic constitution whether that's the Malaysian constitution or the Singapore constitution and there's usually this rhetoric that will accompany it that and therefore you know we should not be looking to foreign sources or international law or all of this like they don't apply within the four walls of our constitution and there was certainly a very strong trend uh, towards the four walls doctrine in you know let's say like the post the the, like the last uh, the pre twenty ten cases or even some of the court cases uh, after the twenty ten case and so I think you see j just like the just like with any of these doctrines purposive or proportionality they kind of go in the same direction the judges that are trying to to uh, push for more robust judicial review in these contexts. And I think of even the Indira Gandhi case could be a nice example here, because you see a very different use of international human rights law in that case. This is a case about um, the uh, unilateral custody of a child when the one of the parents had converted to Islam. And so there's questions about, you know, whether if, uh, so this is a mother whose, whose, whose husband had converted to Islam and then claimed for custody of the, of the all three children in the marriage and had converted all three children to Islam without her knowledge or her awareness and then had, and then had um, gone ahead and, and claimed custody in the Sharia court, right? And so you see, like, interestingly, I think the high court opinion, you have, a, a, the, so there's high court, court of appeal and federal court, the high court opinion, you have a sort of very robust opinion where they look at a bunch of international human rights treaties such as and on you know rights of equality of each parent they quote you know UN documents and well he actually is a one judge uh, opinion and and certainly like says that in line with Malaysia's international human rights commitments like this is it, it must be the case that we should interpret the constitution to have equal rights to both parents in which case the mother will have like an equal should have equal say right in the in the in the child's religious upbringing as well as the custody situation and then you see the court of appeal taking like an, an exact opposite approach saying you know very four walls doctrine kind of rhetoric like no you know like saying specifically about the high court decision uh the, the high court was wrong to look in, at all these outside sources when we're just looking at our domestic constitution and and then has a sort of very narrow rigid formalistic approach to its to its um understanding the equality provision in the Malaysian constitution and then like the federal court like then in the in, in the Indira Gandhi case the federal court ultimately unanimously um, in that case I think was striking on two fronts like one we've already talked about earlier which is the assertion of judicial power by basically uh, affirming the basic structure doctrine but it did that in this context in this context of affirming the mother's right to have an equal to have an equal say an equal right in the in in the 
in the religious conversion and custody of the child. And so, which is particularly striking because well, the end well knows that you know, religion in the Malaysian context is probably like one of the most fraught areas, right, for like the civil courts to 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 wade into. So I think and so there again you see like a broader approach towards like uh, that much more accommodating of sort international international, not just international human rights law, but I think like just just ideas of um, more global ideas of how one might treat constitutional adjudication and constitutional interpretation, including purposivism, like in the sense of saying that, you know, the purpose of the constitution can't be just simply say that every he simply means just just literally he, like you know, like the one parent. It must mean both parents in this context, because that's what equality provision should protect. And I think that like, that's one case where you see a very strong use of both purposive interpretation and um, and also establishing a basic structure doctrine. This is a 20, the 2018 case of Indira Gandhi. But if anyone wants to add on to this, I would be delighted. Yeah, uh, if, if I could chime in, uh, perhaps just to add that, um, at least in my opinion, I think it depends on the kind of cases that the courts are, are faced with, certainly in Malaysia. Uh, I would say that there is greater judicial um, openness, uh, not just to international human rights instruments, as uh, Yvonne pointed out, but kind of the global conversations on constitutional law uh, and, and, and foreign jurisprudence. We see this uh, in Singapore in the case of review publishing, for instance, uh, how the court uh, referred to uh, certain cases in, in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, and so on. They, they might not necessarily agree with those cases, but there is some reference to those. And in Malaysia, uh, too, increasingly in, in a lot of cases. With respect to international human rights obligations, more specifically, um, I, I guess I would recall the case of Norfadila, which is a gender discrimination case. And there, the court uh, held or, or, or rather acknowledged that the word gender in the constitution in Article 8.2 um, was included pursuant to Malaysia's CEDAW uh, obligation. So I thought that that was quite um, um, important in that respect. Great. Just jump in on Singapore quickly and just say that uh, for most constitutional courts or courts that deal with constitutional issues, right, the bread and butter cases will relate to ICCPR, but Singapore has not signed ICCPR. So that's, if you haven't signed that treaty, then the, there's great limits on how courts can enforce those rights domestically, especially in, in light of the four wars doctrine that Yvonne talks about. Great. Um, so we have another question in the chat from Jatin Tripathi, who I assume is Yvonne's former student because he also adds a comment about how it's nice to listen to Yvonne after a long time. Um, and the question is about, again, the basic structure doctrine, right? How powerful do you think basic structure doctrine can be in the face of rising authoritarianism, given that the doctrine is heavily dependent on judges? who are willing to invoke those in cases that are presented in front of them. And he points out here that even if you have a relatively well-functioning judiciary, there are always external pressures. And he mentioned specifically the Indian example where recent research has shown that um, members of the Indian Supreme Court have, um, or it seems to show, shows a correlation, or you never know causation, a correlation between judges close to retirement and ruling toward ruling in favor of the government with the idea that judges rule in favor of the government so that they get a plum government job um, after they retire. And so perhaps the implication here is, are those kinds of pressures something that we worry about in Malaysia or Singapore? And do you think that might affect the use of the basic structure doctrine? Great. Well, hello, Jatin. It's great to have a question from you after a long time. Um, yes, Jatin was part of my comparative constitutional law uh, class at, here at Georgetown a year or so ago. And, um, and so I, I, I'm delighted to hear from you and to hear a question on unconstitutional constitutional amendment and the basic structure of doctrine in the face of rising authoritarianism. We wonder where we studied all those doctrines in great detail in the, over the last year or so. So, we, so on this note, I think um, so I think a couple of things that can, can be said here. I mean, how powerful do we really think that constitutional constitutional amendment doctrine in light of the fact that it's heavily dependent on judges that are willing to invoke those um, as, a, as a 
sort of preliminary point, I'd say like, yes, that's certainly true. Like a lot of like this, this account is premised on judicial will and in some sense like judicial ability to uh, judicial both, not just ability, but ability and willingness, right? And so part of the of my account is though to say that, well, willingness has to, even the judicial willingness itself has to be founded on something. And so part of like what judges who might want to build up the ability to then assert this against a powerful government have to lay the foundations. And that's what the, 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 the strategies of tools of statecraft are about, right? You might start with some, with a case in which, it's, in which you lay the foundation and then you might build on it in the future so that you then have, so that you're then able to, to draw on or develop a, a, a doctrine like the basic structure doctrine. Um, for future confrontation. In fact, in, in my most recent uh, article, I actually uh, look at some of the features of strategic judicial empowerment more broadly, so not just in Malaysia, but in Pakistan, in the United Kingdom, in Malawi, to sort of think, to think through some of these strategies um, that judges use in order to judicially empower themselves. Um, and then, so then moving on to what, what kind of external factors uh, would might, might give rise or sort of might uh, tend to influence whether judges are willing to exercise strategic assertiveness in establishing. I think that uh, you can, we can maybe like bring out a couple of a couple of, of, of situations in which we see judges most willing to assert this kind of, even in the face of authoritarianism. One is what um, Rehan has spoken about earlier, which is the when the judicial institution itself finds its own turf under threat, right? That tends to be a situation where I think judges the world over um, have been most willing to assert to assert, uh, to assert the, the kind of like, um, basic structure doctrine. And then second, I think like moments of political or constitutional rupture, I think often present courts with more space and opportunity to then enhance their own institutional power. Um, a third factor could be things like when a court can build on popular su and political support. This goes a little bit to what Deanne touched on in her comments. So when courts can build on either the popular support in terms of the populace as a whole for the kind of decision it's going to assert, even if that might be one against the government, or or in some context, maybe not so much in these fragile democracies, political support from other branches of government towards a certain decision, you can also see courts being more willing to do that. And then finally, on the point of judicial, on the point of the judges themselves, let me say about this. So you, um, so Jatin brings up uh, the, chief, the former chief justice the argument here, I take it being that if you're thinking post-retirement opportunities and you want to get a plum job, you might not want to rule against the government, right? Is that is the situation here? So what I found fascinating about the Sumni Jaya Indira Gandhi cases, both were unanimous opinions, both were written by one justice, and it was a she. So like on your towering judges, Rehan, it might not have been go fast stream up, it might have been a female chief justice. Um, so the Justice Zainud Ali wrote the opinion on the 2017 and the 2018 cases. They're remarkably robust opinions. They lay out like really sort of very strong, very um, broad assertions of judicial power, separation of powers, judicial independence, and then and, and lay the groundwork entirely for the basic structure doctrine. And they were written, the 2018 Indira Gandhi decision was written just before she would, had to retire. She was due for mandatory retirement in a few months, you know, like, and so, one might say that the, this is the inverse approach to what uh, to what they're pointing out in the Indian in this Indian example that um, Jatina point out, points out, which is that a judge that is maybe inclined to is thinking about judicial legacy, whether that's personal or institutional, might actually be more inclined to assert or to, to lay out some sort of legacy in the face of um, for for the institution before he or she leaves leaves the institution, right? So we see this very much, I think, like in the Sermoni Jaya 2017 case, and then in like building on that in the 2018 case, and then retiring within a matter of months. So it's, I mean, it seems to me like, you know, this was a, this, this, this is a situation where the, the judge, where judges, where external factors may well come into the sense of like thinking about institutional personal legacy, um, and, but, but cutting in the other direction from, from the example that we have here, in that, like, instead of it like, being deferential, the a judge might well be like, "Well, this is the point to be assertive. This is the point to to leave with a parting gift, both to the judiciary and also for my own personal legacy as a judge, right?" Which, as Rayhan's work in towering judges, I think, is uh, speaks to some of this as well more broadly. And I think, like, that's the one that kind of good good example in the Malaysian context, at least. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, so I think we have a question from um, Professor Alex Schwartz, who I think can 
unmute himself. Thank you very much for talking about this important book. And um, so I have a quick question on. Uh, Maybe it's not so quick, but a question on it anyway. Um, so one of the things I really like about the book is that it combines a strategic account with a normative account. And that's, I, I think, a lovely thing to see in uh, our field uh, when those two things come together. Um, but there's, a, there's a, an additional factor, let's say, uh, outside of the strategic and the normative here, which would be, I guess you could say, the sort of pure attitudinal uh, political preferences of the judges so I, I think that I mean I share your, your um, I'm persuaded by your arguments about about some of the strategic behavior, but it seems to me that to get a kind of further leverage on this question of the extent to which judges have been strategically engaged in statecraft, we also need to know where they stand, uh, or at least have a, a really good idea where they stand ideologically, where their preferences are. And so in the Malaysian context, I know that uh, some recent work has attempted uh, to, so Bjorn Dressel and Tomu Inu have a piece recently published, which finds evidence of the influence of uh, politics, ethnicity, and so on, 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 on judicial decision-making in, in the Malaysian context. Uh, so I think, and I, I wondered what, so I think that's an important thing to have to try to use that then to build a story about when judges are being strategic or not. So for example, in the Singapore case, one reason why the, the the courts have been so deferential and restrained, it might not be that they feel constrained, but that they they are ideologically inclined to <laughs> to support the uh, the government. So um, so if we're going to really get at when they're being strategic and when they're being attitudinal, we need to also have the attitudinal element in there to understand when they're being strategic. I think that's that's, that's my question. So what's the potential for that, or do you think this is a black box that we can't get at? Um, it's a great question. I, I mean, I would love it not to be a black box and that we could get get into it. I think some have tried, right? But I think like as with judicial, uh, ju as with as with judicial narratives the world over, like you know, that's that's that's, that's so only so much that we are, that will that that would be available to us. I will say a couple of things like in terms of the Malaysian judge Malaysian judges in particular. I think certainly I think the story here that the the the, the attitudinal story you're talking about here has to be linked with judicial appointments. Right. And like that story, like it's like an immensely important one anywhere. But I think particularly in the Malaysian context, I think you certainly see a narrative surrounding the 1988 crisis where the well, then Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed and administration and the, uh, the, the removal of the Chief Justice, the Law President and two other Supreme Court justices. And then sort of and not just them, but then a swath of like, other judges being appointed at that point. Um, and the sense then that that was like a distinct shift in the attitudes of the judges that were on the on the Malaysian judiciary, to say the least. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that over the years, I, I mean, I like the thing that the, the, the optimistic story here is that there has been greater diversity in appointment of judges, in the, even in the Malaysian context, in terms of women, um, you know, not a, a different ethnic group and religious groups um, as well. And so the makeup of the judges might be gradually changing. And that will have an impact on judicial decision making, but it's but it is you know still a process where you see I think I think what you see especially in a lot of these cases is a is the majority and minority decision making. It seems very clear that the attitudinal preferences and ideological preferences of of, of uh, those are writing these very strong dissenting opinions versus the majority opinions or vice versa that there is a shift in or rather they're like they're, they're certainly uh different schools of thought on the bench and that's a, and it's not a universal it's not sort of like a, as flat a line as it would have been i think even like 15 years ago um, or even i might go as far as to say like that uh, it has greater diverse, even greater differences than with the singapore courts and judges because i feel like the even then even if there are dissenting opinions it's probably less stark in terms of the contrast in which in which those opinions seem to be pushing for just different, uh, different constitutional visions or purposes, one might say. Um, so I think that's 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 my sense of judicial of the judicial makeup. But I think like that's certainly like a, a, an important and complex part of the story. And I wonder if any of the other panelists, um, maybe even Deanne, has any thoughts on this particular point. <laughs> 
Dion or Wilkin? Um, yeah, j just a very uh, uh, short point. I, I think in Malaysia, the judges certainly don't wear ideological blinkers. Um, and uh, this, for that reason, I, I emphasize in, in my comment, in addition to thinking about, uh, you know, the, the kinds of regimes that court find themselves in or judges find themselves in, um, it, it's also very important to think about the broader political dynamics, social political dynamics, particularly tied to ethnicity and, and religion. And I think we can see this in uh, certain extrajudicial comments uh, or, or writings. For instance, uh, the uh, former Chief Justice, Tun Abdul Hamid, we can see where his uh, leanings are. Uh, so, so that's just one, one example. Yeah. I think I, I certainly agree, and I would, and I, and on the point that in Malaysia, I think there's an additional element as well is always sort of religion and ethnicity, right? As like part of the background of how one views like the uh, constitutional adjudication, and the leanings there are strong often, and and are also visible and obviously made in like in both like judicial and extrajudicial like uh, opinions. But again, I think it's a there's a significant difference in um, the editorial approaches of different judges on the bench and I think it would be even the recent cases where we see these really strong dissents being hit by the Chief Justice now like I think you already see sort of this um, I don't know if it's generational but at least like some sort of like difference in like uh, the approaches between like um, different schools on the bench itself. Okay on that note perhaps we should end. Um, we thank the all the panelists, the discussants for great comments, um, audience for, for excellent questions, especially Professor Yvonne Q for this wonderful book um, that we've all benefited from so much. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you all so much. May I thank, uh, so thank you, Rehan, Dian, Pojan, and the centers and both your centers for doing such excellent work in the region. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. I hope to continue it in uh, as we go along and hopefully we can have a dialogue in person <laughs> yes i would love a dialogue in person <laughs> over <laughs> over dim sum maybe <laughs> <laughs> on that note <laughs> let's close